Across the UK, about one in four people will experience a mental health problem each year. In England, one in six report experiencing a mental health problem in any given week. In 2019, with growing anxiety around jobs, money and changes in benefits, that figure could increase. It means the services we rely on to guide us through tough times are more vital than ever before. But some, especially local services, are at risk. Years of funding cuts mean people with poor mental health struggle to get the same level of care they once did. In 2018, the government announced funding for mental health services will grow as a share of the NHS budget, but it is not enough. So uh, it's all, and, and no, but you don't need to tell anybody which it is. It's your best day. It could actually be a completely imaginative thing. The Haven Project in Colchester was set up in 2004 with money from the Department of Health to support people with personality disorder, which often stems from early childhood trauma. The service was receiving significant funding from the Department of Health, up to £600,000. Now they receive nothing. Peniel Peterson, project manager, said the service has been at risk of closure. So the government wanted to do something different and make a much better model of care available. The Haven was one of 11 pilot projects that was set up then with the Department of Health money and we ran with that money for about um, 11 years. At that time that money came to an end and that's when uh, we had to look to a different kind of model of care, not necessarily insofar as it didn't provide uh, the right kind of care, but we had to cut back. In the first 10 years, we were supported by the Department of Health um, funding, and that was uh, very reasonable and we could do a lot with it. So in the first 10 years, we were at Glen Avenue in an old vicarage, and we had um, access also to provide rooms where people could stay, beds where people could stay. If they came two very significant and traumatic anniversaries. The other significant difference between then and now is that that project was running for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So they could always ring in and get crisis support. They could always come in and sit and get uh, re-established in a calm, quiet place in the safe centre. They could always have access to the project at all hours of the day. And that is something we've not been able to provide with a third of the funding, as you can imagine. However, when we didn't get the local authority funding that we had expected and had been led to, uh, to believe that we would be receiving, when that fell through and we, had, we cut down to a third of the budget, and you know, thank God that the lottery did support us, but it was a much, much, much smaller uh, service. What they offer now is recovery work and one-to-one -one therapeutic support. In addition to that, and this is where our project is unique, it's a client-led project. So pe the clients are engaged at every single level of our activity. They are engaged in setting up the recovery group themes. They are engaged very intimately in what kind of therapeutic support they're needing. And they are engaged actually in the modelling of what we actually provide. And that has been the case from the very early days in 2004, and it is still the case today. So the key point was the withdrawal of the Department of Health funding and the falling through of what we believed or were led to believe that the clinical commissioners would provide us with. We were in fact left high and dry and I thought it's do or die, I've got to get some grant funding. Even if we have a lot less than we had before, it'll be something. Due to cuts in statutory funding, the service was closed for a couple of months in early 2015. Staffing levels were reduced from 20 to 5. Despite this, the service is expected to see up to 190 clients from Colchester and the surrounding areas on the books this year. Thankfully, they have three years of lottery funding to keep them going, as well as money from local trusts. But statutory funding is still crucial. 
The responsibility for looking after local mental health services falls with the North East Essex Clinical Commissioning Group, who say they're focused on ensuring patients receive the care and treatment they need. They said while they recognise the outstanding service the Haven Project provided, unfortunately the project was only capable of treating a very small proportion of people in the UK. To be quite honest with you, the general outlook all over England, not just here, is <clears throat> that statutory resources are declining and the need for resources in health, including mental health, are increasing. So the gap between need and um, um, uh, resources is widening. Julie Hexley has been a client at the Haven Project for about 10 years. She now represents the clients on the advisory group. But her story has not always been so bright. When I arrived at the Haven, I was a shivering wreck, basically. And now I'm chairman of the Haven Advisory Group. She was first admitted to hospital and the psychiatrist warned her if she did not seek help from the Haven Project, she would be institutionalised for the rest of her life. Out of a cohort of 600 people across 15 years, the Haven Project's suicide rate is unmatched at 0.25%. Julie, how would you feel if the service was ever to, to close? Well, I think I would suffer deep depression, which I did when we closed previously, and that was just for a few months, or possibly even complete suicide. The North East Essex Clinical Commissioning Group said they were proud to have funded the Youth Inquiry Service in Colchester for more than 10 years and have contributed funding towards a counselling service for young people in the past. Jane Blomley is the service's CEO. We were set up in 1988 and we were established by a group of local people who were really worried about the children and the young people of the area kind of falling through the net of the statutory services and we, I believe, rented a room on East Hill to begin with and was set up as a peer support organisation um, and then funding came in and we were listening to the uh, needs of the young people. We very quickly started to develop a counselling service so we could give more structured support to them. Um, funding was lost, funding came in, funding was lost again as these things happen. We were in the depths of quite a big depression I think in 1988 and uh, at one point we went from a double-decker bus that someone gave us that we drove around town to kind of use as an outsource just rather than disappear completely. We camped in um, the Wilson Marriage Centre, which is an adult education centre now. Uh, then we went, we got some property in East Stockwell Street. We rented quite a nice building before my time in East Stockwell Street. And I joined the Youth Inquiry Service about six months after we'd lost that lease because the rent went up and we lost some funding. And we were camping in Greyfriars, which was on the point of being closed and converted into a hotel. And we were literally camping in one little office under the stairs, virtually. It's a little cubby hole now, a snug in the new hotel they've developed it into. Um, so that's when I joined, and we had virtually no money, and we were six months away from closing. We had a few thousand pounds in the bank, just enough to cover redundancies, and I was taken on on a six-month uh, temporary contract to see if I could do anything to make it kind of work, really. Last year, a thousand children and young people needed support. Their waiting lists were a minimum of four weeks to six months for counselling. It's, there's always a disparity between what our funding allows us to see and the numbers of people that come to us for help. Um, and so what we have to do sometimes is close our waiting lists. Because what we don't want to do is be turning people away at the door. Um, but also what we don't want to do is have people sitting on a waiting list for a year when we know that the funding is going to run out before that. Uh, before we can see them. So we've, it's a really difficult balancing act about how do we manage the flow through of clients, young people in need, with the capacity that we have to actually help them. You know, the old uh, style of support from the statutories for young people has pretty much gone. Our counselling service is no longer funded by statutory services from the end of March, uh, which I think is quite shocking, to be honest. Um, and our homeless, uh, sorry, and our teenage pregnancy is uh, now funded by another source. In early 2017, the Clinical Commissioning Group took a decision to integrate a number of young people's mental health services. They said the benefit of a single contract is that services become more streamlined and improve access for patients via a single point of contact.
When asked what their plan was to help save local mental health services, a Department of Health and Social Care spokesperson said the mental health of children and young people in particular was their key priority for this government. As part of their NHS long-term plan, they've committed to increasing the funding for children and young people's mental health services. The hope is it will give more than 300,000 more young people access to NHS-funded medical health services. Essex County Council said it would still be investing money in support for families using the service. In addition to this, the leader of the council announced it will be making an additional £1 million available to deliver mental health services. There are three main pillars of support the service offers. Homelessness prevention, teenage pregnancy and parenting and counselling. And there were three main funders of these services. In the next financial year, the only funding linked to statutory is the Homelessness Prevention Fund. Other than this, there is a loose tapestry of support from local businesses and trusts. Maria Hales is the counselling coordinator. We have <coughs> definitely seen a rise um, in the anxiety and depression. Um, there's all sorts of questions around why that might be. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I could talk about those too. Um, but definitely we have seen a rise. I think sort of maybe five, six years ago maybe we had a lot of people presenting with anger issues and that seems to have gone on now to anxiety and depression. Um, and I think doctors last year were saying that young people presenting with anxiety and depression had gone up by a third. So quite a, an increase and we've been noticing it for some time too. Children as young as six are being seen. We, we were really oversubscribed, admittedly we had one person doing that work, but she was absolutely um, drowning in referrals. Uh, as you wouldn't think primary school um, aged children would kind of be dealing with these things, but actually it's presenting more and more younger children um, are still suffering with things like anxiety and depression and obviously f um, family splitting up and that sort of thing, parental dis divorce. Um, domestic violence, these sorts of things all filter into to those things. So yeah, actually there is quite a demand and we would like to be able to get more funding to continue that service and in fact expand that service because there seems to be quite um, poor representation for that age group actually, which is why I think we were kind of drowning when we were offering it. So without that early intervention, clearly young people's mental health is going to get worse you get a huge knock-on effect from that, you know, in terms of um, young people's outcomes and opportunities. If their mental health is poor, their physical health can become poor, their anxiety means that they might not finish school or be unable to go to college or university. The service has saved many lives over the years. Another young man, a similar situation, who had been suffering terrible abuse in his childhood and, and had seen his abuser in the street and came in for counselling and was absolutely beside himself because it had re-traumatised him again and um, we needed to put in place some safety measures, getting him some extra support um, and help because he was feeling so suicidal and he said almost the same thing when he came back into counselling, you know, if you hadn't have been here last week I probably wouldn't have been here. 